there. So today I'd like to talk to you about the energy stored in magnetic fields. So remember we've been talking about RL circuits or circuits with resistors and inductors. So in a circuit with an inductor the battery has to supply more energy than in a circuit without an inductor and this is due to the back EMF the inductor generates. In an RL circuit Part of the energy supplied by the battery is going to appear as internal energy in the resistor. Of course, that's converted to heat. But the remaining energy has to be stored in the magnetic field of the inductor. To understand this, let's remember back to the example problem that we did in the previous lecture. It's shown here in the circuit. You had a 30 volt battery a switch put to a resistor and then a parallel path with a resistor on one side and an inductor on the other. We talked about what would happen right after the switch was closed, right? So right after the switch was closed, the current is all going to flow through this 20 ohm resistor because the inductor is generating so much back EMF that won't let anything through. But then, once everything comes to a steady state, there's um, current flowing through this inductor on the right-hand side. And when it reaches that steady state, this inductor is taking all of the current, basically acting like a short and bypassing this 20 ohm resistor. When it did that, there was a nice steady current through the inductor. And then the problem said, okay, open the switch again, and now what happens? And then what happens is the inductor and the resistor form a complete circuit by themselves. The inductor will try and maintain that current. And to do that, it'll force current to flow through that 20 ohm resistor. So it acts as a source of EMF for a little while, even without the battery, until all the energy built up in the inductor is depleted. So we know that the energy has to be stored in the magnetic field because otherwise, if we open the switch again, no current would flow anywhere. That energy has to come from somewhere, and it comes from the magnetic field in the inductor. Let's look at this simple RL circuit where the resistor and the inductor are all in series with a battery here. If you were to write the Kirchhoff's loop rule equation for this um, circuit, it might look like this. The EMF of the battery minus the voltage drop across the resistor, which is minus IR, and then minus the back EMF generated by this inductor, which would be minus L DIET, and that would equal to zero, of course, as you come back around to the back side of your battery. Now, remember our equation for power in circuits. Power is just I times delta V, which for a resistor is I squared R, okay? So if I look at my loop rule equation and I multiply everything in that loop rule by I, then I would have I times the EMF in my battery minus I squared R minus L I D I D T, and that has to equal to zero. So you can see that if we just multiply the loop rule equation by the current, then we have the equation for power in that circuit. So remember, power is the time rate of change of the energy. So we said before that when you write your Kirchhoff's loop rule equation, it's really just a restatement of conservation of energy, right? I times the EMF is the rate at which the energy is being supplied by the battery, and then the, the inductor and the um, resistor will dissipate and store the energy provided by that battery. I squared R is the rate at which the energy is being delivered to the resistor, which is then converted to heat. And then LDIDT must be the rate at which energy is being stored in that magnetic field. Let's call the potential energy stored in the inductor at any given time, we'll call it U. It's a common abbreviation that we use or a common symbol that we use for potential energy. To get it to set equal to the power, power would be du dt. So that would be the rate at which energy is being stored in the inductor. And then, of course, that would be equal to L I D I E T. Now, to find the total energy and not the power, what you could do is multiply everything through by D T to cancel that out, and then integrate both sides. So you'd have D U is equal to L I D I, and then you would integrate both sides. When you integrate D U, you get U. And then when you integrate the right-hand side, L is a constant, depending on the geometry of whatever kind of inductor you've got. So you can pull that out. It's not dependent on the current. And you would have L times the integral of I di. Now, if you're starting out at time t is equal to zero with no energy stored in the inductor, then you would be integrating that 
from 0 to i. When you integrate i di from 0 to i, you get, of course, 1 half L i squared there. Okay? So the total energy stored in an inductor with a current i running through it would be 1 half L i squared. Let's go through and derive the equation for the energy stored in magnetic fields by taking a closer look at the solenoid. We've already found the self-inductance L for a solenoid in a previous lecture. That inductance is equal to mu naught, the permeability of free space, times n squared a over L. n is the number of turns in the solenoid, a is the cross-sectional area of the solenoid, and L is the length of the solenoid. Now, if we plug that into the equation for the energy stored, 1 half Li squared, we end up with 1 half times mu naught times n squared a i squared over L, okay? So that would be the energy stored in a solenoid that has a current I running through it. Okay, taking that over to the um, new slide here, 1 half mu naught n squared a over L times I squared. Let's remember that the magnetic field for a solenoid, in the interior, of course, of an ideal solenoid, B is equal to mu naught times N over L times I. So, remember, sometimes we write this as mu naught times little n times I, but little n is just the number of turns per unit length, which is big N over L, okay? Now, if we plug in for B into our equation for U, then we would end up with u is equal to 1 half times b squared times a l over mu naught. If you're having a little trouble following the algebra that quickly, pause the video and make sure that you arrive at the same expression for the energy as me. Okay, now a times l. a is the cross-sectional area of that solenoid and l is the length. So if I multiply those two things together, what I'm really doing is finding the volume of the interior of my solenoid, which I'll call V. So then the energy stored in a solenoid could be written as 1 half V squared V over mu naught. So basically what we're saying is that the energy stored is related to the magnetic field squared, okay? Now, if you wanted the magnetic field energy density, that would be the energy divided by the volume. So if we do that to both sides of this equation, then we end up with the magnetic field energy density, which is little u sub b, and that's 1 half b squared over mu naught. Now, although we derived this for a very specific application, specifically a solenoid, it's a general expression that's valid whenever you have a magnetic field. The magnetic field energy density will always be equal to 1 half b squared over mu naught. So this might remind you of an earlier expression that we arrived at for the energy density of an electric field. That one was ue is equal to 1 half epsilon naught e squared. So you can see that the energy stored in electric or in magnetic fields is proportional to the strength of those fields squared in very similar looking expressions. Remember, mu naught is the permeability of free space, 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 in SI units. Epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, which is 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 in SI units. To sum up, a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor, they're all going to store energy through different mechanisms. If you have a start charge capacitor, that's going to store energy as ele electric potential energy going to store it in the electric field that exists in between the capacitor plates. The inductor, when it carries a current, is going to store energy as a magnetic potential energy, or the magnetic field, for example, that's present inside of an inductor in the solenoid or toroid or whatever kind of inductor that you have. And if you have a resistor, that energy that's delivered to it is going to be transformed into internal energy, or heat. Okay, I hope that was clear. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm ready.